نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد رسوله النبي الأمين المكين الحنين الكريم الرؤوف الرحيم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسبة حسنة صدق الله مولانا العظيم our honorable chief guest the great scholar muhaddis faqih and dai of syria al-shaykh sayyid muhammad asad asagar ji damat barakatukum and all other ulama shuyukh from Egypt from other parts of the world respected ulama brothers and sisters in Islam associates of Minhajul Quran and workers of Muslim Youth League, students of Fargana Institute, and other respected guests and participants of this conference today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. All praise to Almighty Allah, the Creator and Cherisher of the whole world, and our Salat and greetings and salutations on Holy Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. the mercy for the whole mankind and all worlds I would like in the beginning to congratulate my beloved son and very sincere da'i in the path of Almighty Allah, Allama Muhammad Ramadan Al Qadri, and all of his colleagues and organization of Minhaj Al Quran Manchester, and Minhaj members of the Minhaj Al Quran UK, and members of Muslim Youth League UK, our son. Brother Tasneem and Sister's Wing, our daughter, Sister Tanzim, and their colleagues, and all those youth who have worked hard in order to organize this great event and to make it successful. Alhamdulillah ta'ala which has become successful by the grace of Almighty Allah and blessings of Holy Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. After this formal and cordial congratulation, without spending any time on the preface of my talk, 
I would like directly to step on the main subject and to start with the main content of my speech or lecture today, which I have chosen for this particular event. No doubt this is an opportunity of pleasure for me that a certain very important members of our community who have already met me here on the stage and among them one is the member of the European Parliament and the ex-Lord Mayor of Manchester and the councillors of the Great Manchester and many other speakers, scholars and honourable guests who are participants of this convention today. The subject for today's discourse which I have selected is very interesting. That is not a classical subject in its nature. Because of youth, I have chosen a modern aspect. Today I would like to appreciate and I would like to place a study of Islam in the light of the seerah of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam with special emphasis on those aspects which are the subjects and topics of our concern today so that we may address those concerns of the society, of the humanity and those problems which are troubling the Muslim Ummah as well as the Western peoples and because of those particular topics and subjects Islam is being highly misunderstood and because of certain groups prevailing in various parts of the Muslim world Islam is being wrongly represented wrongly presented Islam is being wrongly introduced to the Western peoples And lots of confusions, misunderstandings and misleading ideas are existing in the minds of youth in our age. And these topics have become the subjects of discussions all over the world. So I decided to choose some of these aspects and dimensions of Islam or Islamic teachings which I would like to elaborate, I would like to highlight, I would like to explain and substantiate through evidences of the seerah of Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I would like to start my discourse from this point that everybody knows that Islam as a deen was revealed 14, 15 hundred years ago. And Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was raised as the last prophet and the last messenger 
for the mankind again 14 to 1500 years ago. But question is why still his seerah, his life, his teaching and the book revealed on him and the sunnah and the model of conduct provided by him why it is still considered to be the model of perfection for the mankind when 1400 years have already passed. All those civilizations which existed in that time, those cultures, those philosophies, those thoughts and ideas, which existed in that era, they have been ceased to be practiced now. They are not accepted as the update knowledge for today. No personality of that time other than Islam, no philosopher of that time, no political leader, king of that time, no social reformer of that time is known to be the man of present century and man of present time. Then why this position is just accorded to Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The life has changed Circumstances have already changed. Our social factors of our life, economic factors of our life, political factors of our life, psychological factors of our life, each and every aspect of human life in its individual sphere as well as in its collective sphere whether it is intellectual or practical has undergone hundreds and hundreds of stages of changes and alterations. In spite of this fact that life has totally changed, why we are supposed as Muslims, why we are supposed to accept the life of Prophet Muhammad and his teachings of Islam as the perfect model of behavior or as a model of perfection for the mankind. Why is this? So we have to address this question. Not in a way that we are satisfied, but in a way that those who don't believe in Islam they should also feel satisfied. Islam declared this fact in Holy Quran for the whole of mankind that the perfect model of behavior or the only model of perfection was available is available and would be available for all times to come in the life, conduct and behavior of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ummah of Islam and all generations of human beings are supposed to follow this model because there is no other model of perfection which could be followed and which could lead to the destination of success except then the life of Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in order to answer this question I would like to take you 
to that particular age when Holy Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam was born and he was raised as Allah's messenger. Whenever we want to evaluate a personality, whenever we want to appreciate the works of a personality, his teachings, it is necessary for us to evaluate his personality, his teaching, his conduct, his behavior, his works, everything in relation of the time, in context of the time, age and society in which he was raised and in which he was born and in which he delivered. The circumstances which prevailed at the time of the birth of Holy Prophet or at the time of the raising of Holy Prophet wasallam, they were absolutely worse. When we look into the conditions of the life in pagan Arab society, we feel that all moral norms, norms of morality, all human values, all social values had already been eliminated from the surface of earth. We see at that time in the pagan Arab society or in Arabian Peninsula, we find everywhere an atmosphere of tyranny, an atmosphere of violence, an atmosphere of cruelty, an atmosphere of injustice, an environment of tribal prides, Environment of collective killings, tribal wars, environment of prejudices, enmities, and an environment of absolute immorality. There was no purity, concept of purity and no concept of modesty at all. Drinking was the common practice of the people. Dance of the naked women was a common practice of various festivals. The Arabs of their society used to bury their daughters soon after their birth. There was no dignity for any woman, for any girl, for any daughter. Rather, there was no dignity, concept of the dignity of man. There was no concept of equality of human beings. There were thefts, there were killings, and everywhere there were violent behaviors. And the widows normally in some tribes, they were taken as the property by their sons to inherit. Even people belonging to many Arab, pagan Arab society, tribes, they used to perform tawaf of Kaaba in naked forms, along with singings and clapping their hands. The poor and the needy and the slaves, they had no place in their society. They were totally humiliated. There was no concept of benevolence, no concept of generosity, no concept of truthfulness. 
then there was no concept of knowledge the society was totally illiterate there was no book to read no school to go to the people of pagan arab society they hated used to hate reading and writing they used to depend just on their memories and this was their pride in all these situations all historical global civilizations had already dispersed and they have been demolished by the passage of time there was sumeric civilization a very cultured society but it did not exist at that time it was finished along with all of its influences there used to be in the history egyptian civilization but along with all its contribution it exists no more existed at that time there used to be greek civilization which became the founder of philosophy and science of that time but again because of its downfall it had no influence in other parts of the world it was paralyzed there used to be iranian civilization there used to be indian civilization there used to be roman civilization and there was in sometimes byzantine civilization the latest civilization of that time but all civilizations had ceased to be effective or to be exist as alive civilizations of the world europe at that time was in total darkness in this particular situation holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was raised and the most interesting thing is that when he was raised he came in this particular society in this particular set of global circumstances and global atmosphere where there was no concept of any good any moral attitude any ethical behavior any spiritual values in this particular society a person who was raised as the messenger of god a holy person who was raised as the last prophet of almighty allah in that pagan arab society consisted of all these bad character he came sallallahu taala alaihi wa sallam and introduced a new civilization to the world he introduced a new culture to the history of mankind the new culture in the name of islam which was based on his revealed book quran and the and the practical model and conduct given by his personal life that was known as his sunna and seera the culture new culture which emerged from his teachings which emerged from his conduct and it was given the name of islam he came with that message in that particular environment in that particular atmosphere where there was no place for knowledge in a society where there was no place of any good in a society where there was no place of any moral behavior and any ethical attitude 
in a society where there was no place for any truthfulness no place for any modesty no place for softness no place for kindness no place for soft heartedness no place for generosity no place for good moral ethical and spiritual manners no place for pure behavior of man human life no place for human dignity in this particular society he was raised and he announced the basic foundations of his culture of his message of his deen of his religion of his teaching and the culture which he established and the culture which he introduced to the mankind in a new chapter which he wrote in the history of humanity that consisted of basic and foundational values and principles basic fundamental principles it was based on the concept of human dignity he introduced the concept of human equality he came up with the concept of human liberty and freedom he stood up with the concept of brotherhood and generosity he came up with the concept of socio economic justice in the society he stood up with the concept of tolerance and moderation and he stood up with the concept of peace and security and he started his movement from the message of knowledge the first revolution of holy quran which actually became the first message delivered by him to the mankind when he came down from the cave of hira to the valley of mecca the meccans were his audience those who were proud of their illiteracy and he came up with the first message of divine revelation to them and he is starting his divine mission of prophethood with the message of knowledge in a society which is known to be the enemy of knowledge with the words iqra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq khalaq al insana min alaq iqra wa rabbukal akram al ladhi allama bil qalam allama al insana ma lam ya'lam read in the name of your lord who created you he started his message in the name of lord in a society where they were aware of 364 lords in the battle of this plurality in the beginning of his message he was giving his message of unity and oneness of almighty allah then he was talking of the phenomena of creation then he was talking of the science the phenomena how a child takes birth in the womb of mother a subject of biology a subject of embryology khalaq al insan min alaq your lord create the man from something which is hanging with the endometrium of the uterus of mother an absolute new scientific idea which was never known to the peoples of that time because the prevalent scientific knowledge and the prevalent embryonic embryological knowledge which existed at that time was the aristotelian theory was the greek science this was totally a different point of view he was talking of embryology then he was talking of the greatness of almighty allah then he was talking of the knowledge and pen 
Allazi allama bil qalam. Knowledge and the source of knowledge is the pen. Then he was talking of Allah mal insana ma'alam ya'alam. He was opening all doors and areas of knowledge for the mankind. His first message which became the beginning of his movement was the message of knowledge. It means he gave a message that he was going to establish a culture based on the significance of knowledge. Based on significance of science, based on significance of philosophy, based on significance of wisdom, based on significance of reasoning, based on significance of intellectual efforts, and based on significance of spiritual connection of the man with his Lord, the Creator. This was his first message, which he was going to build his culture on. An absolutely new thing. Then he was talking about the human dignity. In the words, Walakad karramna bani Adam. And we have made the human beings the dignified creature of this world. Then he was talking of human equality. In the words, Ya yuhannas inna khalaqnaakum min dhakari wa unsa. Ya yuhannasu taku rabbakum ulladhi khalaqakum min nafsim wa'idah. He was talking of unity of mankind. And basing on the unity of mankind, he was talking of equality of mankind. Then he was giving his message of liberty and freedom. Then he was giving his message of brotherhood. He was giving his message of socio-economic justice. Qul amara rabbi bil qis. And he was giving his message of liberty saying la ikraha fi deen. So in these particular circumstances, Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's announcement was a great breakthrough at that time. And this is how he started a new culture in the history of mankind the name of Islam. Now, instead of just studying these aspects in generality, I would like to discuss some aspects with special references. And when we come to the special references, I would say that how Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I will try to take into consideration only the Medinan period. In that particular society which I have already mentioned Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I'm still, I want to give you more a general picture before coming to the specific aspects. In that particular society and in that particular culture, in human culture, Holy Prophet wasallam is talking of peace. And he says, as reported by Bara bin Azib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal has related this hadith of Holy Prophet in his Musnad Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said qal afshul salama taslamu afshul salama taslamu Sayyidina Bara radiallahu ta'ala no, reports that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said spread the peace you will be in peace. In that particular society where the killing is their common feature, their common habit, their common custom. Killings, brutality, barbarianism, violence, terrorism, 
aggression. This is their common practice, Toman, this is their character, their tribal tradition. In that particular atmosphere, he was saying that spread peace everywhere and spread peace for everyone. By spreading peace, you will get the peace. So he begins with peace and ends on peace. Then again, in that particular situation, Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, which is reported by Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this hadith has been related by Imam Muslim in Sahih Kitab al-Iman. He states that Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قَالَ لَا الْجَنَّةِ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَا تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَحَابُوا أَلَا أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى مَا تَحَابُونَ بِهِ قَالُوا بَلَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالْ لَفْشُ السَّلَامَ بَيْنَكُمْ He quoted by Sayyidina Abu Huraira that the Prophet Sallallahu said You people will never enter the paradise until you believe and you will not believe, you will not become the true believers until you develop mutual love with one another. You cannot be considered true believers unless you develop mutual love among yourselves with one another. Then Holy Prophet ﷺ, addressing his people said, Shall I not show you something and shall I not lead you to something whereby you will start loving one another? The companion said, O oh Allah's Messenger, do show us. He said, spread peace among one another. This will lead you to the Jannah. He declared that the peace is the path of Jannah. Peace is the path of Iman. Peace is the path of love. And love is the path of Iman. And Iman is the path of Jannah, of paradise. Today, if somebody says these words today, these words may not be taken, maybe it may not be taken as shocking and amazing and surprising. But I would recommend, just close your eyes for a moment. And don't hear this voice and these words now in this present century where everybody has started speaking on peace, where the people have become aware on the significance of peace, where the whole world is talking against terrorism, against violence. No, just take your mind, take your memories, take your thoughts, take your imagination behind and 1400 years back in that society of pagan Arab society, in their society when there was no concept of peace, when the whole society was prevalent with killings, murdering, slaughterings, indignifying attitudes, violence, tyranny, brutality, cruelty, terrorism and aggression. Just take yourself for a moment in that particular situation and then try to understand a, a prophet has been raised in that particular society and he is addressing who are not aware of the concept of peace anywhere and now he is saying as reported by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu he is saying Wallazi nafsi bayadehi. he is constructing his civilization he is building his culture on the pillars of certain teachings one of those important fundamental teachings is the concept of peace, spreading of peace. And he is raising his voice against violent behavior. He is raising his voice. He is protesting against every kind of aggression. And he is raising his revolutionary, giving revolutionary message against aggression, tyranny and every kind of terrorism by saying wallazi nafsi bi yadihi la tadkhulul jannata hatta tuslimu 
ولا تسلموا حتى تحابوا وفش السلام تحابوا وإياكم والبغضة فإنها هي الحالقة تحلق الدين او كما قال it is narrated by سيدنا أبو هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said by him who has my life in his hands you will never never enter paradise until you embrace Islam now try to understand the steps you will never enter paradise until you embrace Islam and you will never become a true Muslim until you love each other a society of hatred a society which believes in hatred a society where each and every individual has a habit of hating one another everybody is prejudiced in that particular society he is saying that wallah you will never become a true muslim unless you love each other and one another and then he says if you want me to ask if you want to ask me how you will start loving each other he said there is no other way to love except spreading peace for everybody saying salam to one another at the time of meeting and greeting by salam this is the message i would say this is the symbol of islam why these words were made symbol of islam so that every person while meeting everyone the words of greeting should be the words of peace so he should remind it the whole day he said you will never love one another unless you spread the message of islam through the symbol of salam the peace and then he said and refrain from hatred refrain from hatred because this hatred it is what cuts off what does it cut what does it cut off the hatred cuts off religion and deen and iman the hatred is a thing which cuts off the religion and deen and iman so if you want to save your iman you should free your hearts from hatreds and instead of hatred you should practice loving one another and if you love one another through this love you will go to the path of islam and if you become a true muslim and believer this islam will lead you to the gate of jannah and paradise this is the message which holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is giving in that particular society then same prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says which is reported by abdullah bin umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and again this hadith is reported by imam bukhari in al adab al mufrad abdullah bin umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates he relates from holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam u'budu rahman وَأَطْعِمُ الطَّعَامَ وَفْشُ السَّلَامِ تَدْخُلُ الْجِنَانِ Holy Prophet ﷺ said that worship Ar-Rahman Now he is quoting the name of Almighty Allah with the title of Rahma, the mercy. Worship Rahman, the merciful. Feed the hunger spread peace and this behavior of your life will take you to enter to paradise this is what holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated then he says again reported by sayyidina anas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna as-salama ismun min asma'illah ta'ala وَدَاهُ اللَّهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ 
Fafshu salama bainakum. This was the crux of his message. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala no relates from Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, surely as-salam, the peace is the name of one of the names of Almighty Allah which Allah has sent to the people of earth. Hence, spread this peace to one another. And very much among one another it means that frequently to one another. This will connect you to As-Salam, to your Rabb, to your Lord, who is the merciful. Then he was asked, O Messenger of Allah, Ayyul Islam khayrun, qala tut'imu ta'am, wa tuqri'u salam ala man arafta wa man lam ta'arif. You should spread salam for everybody, whether you know him or you don't. After giving this message, now a very important aspect is, I would like to quote another aspect of his practical life, his own practice, his own habit. His own behavior, it is reported by Sayyida Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Imam Muslim has reported this hadith in Kitab salam and Imam Bukhari in his Al-Adab Al-Mufrad. Dakhala rahatum min al-juhud ala Rasulillah sa faqalu as-samu alaykum qalat Aisha tu fafahimtu ha faqultu alaykum as-samu wal-la'na قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مهلا يا عائشة إن الله يحب الرفق في الأمر كله أروى بن زبير reports that the wife of Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدة عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها said that a group of Jews now the Jews dealing with them came to the messenger of Allah and said, As-Samu Alaikum. Sam means death. Instead of saying, As-Salamu Alaikum, they said, As-Samu Alaikum. Sam means death in Arabic. So by uttering this word, they prayed against the Prophet for his death. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala said that she understood what they were uttering. So she said from behind the curtain, she answered them, Death be to you and the curse of Allah be to you. She said, Death be to you and the curse of Almighty Allah be to you. Holy Prophet heard these words. Now here lies his own model of behavior. His own character, integrity of his character, consistency and consonance of his utterance, his speech and his deeds. He said, O Aisha, be gentle and soft and kind. Surely Allah loves mildness and softness in every deed. Even Holy Prophet وسلم, was not happy with answer containing these words. Be death upon you and curse of Allah upon you. He said just I have repeated the same words. Wa alaykum. That's it. This is not our way and this is not our custom to be hard and to be harsh even to our enemies. Then another hadith, Hazrat Mujahid bin Jabr reports, he says that he was sitting with Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu while his slave was peeling the hide of the sheep. He said to his slave, the first thing which you should do after you have finished skinning the sheep the first thing which you have to do after skinning the sheep is to give 
the share of its meat to our Jew neighbor. The first share of this meat should be given to our Jew neighbor. Someone sitting in his company, he remarked with astonishment. He said, Oh, Holy Prophet's companion. And then he said, Why you will give it to a Jew? And then he said, May Allah keep you on the right path. He thought as if this was a wrong thing to do. Abdullah bin Amr said, Surely I have heard the Prophet وسلم, He commend the neighbor so forcefully that I thought he might make him an ear. And he did not create any distinction between Muslim or non-Muslim. This is the right of the neighborhood not based on his religion. That's why in accordance with the sunnah and the commandment of our Prophet وسلم, I love to give the first share to my neighbor irrespective of the fact whether he is a Muslim or a Jew. I have given you some examples just to elaborate that what kind of message was given by Holy Prophet وسلم, when he started building up and constructing an era of new civilization and culture in the name of Islam. In that particular society, in that particular global circumstances, in those particular international atmosphere, that international atmosphere, where there was no place, absolutely no place for these kind of ideas. This was the biggest breakthrough of the history of mankind. This was the biggest moral, ethical and spiritual and political and social revolution of the history of mankind. He was going to change the direction of the history. He was going to change the direction of the mind of mankind. He was going to change the direction of thoughts of mankind. He was going to change the whole dimension of the history. And he was going to establish a new chapter of the culture, a new chapter of the civilization in the name of Islam. And he was going to bring an end to violence. And he was going to start a new era of peace, security, love and brotherhood through Islam. And unfortunately, this is the Prophet وسلم, and this is his deen of Islam, which is unfortunately most misunderstood in the present world. Misrepresented by the East and mis misunderstood by the West. Now, I would like to come to the specific references. Holy Prophet وسلم, decided to immigrate to Medina. And there is the first pledge of allegiance which takes place in Mina. Twelve representatives, a person, twelve, delegate of twelve people arrived from Medina. And they had their first pledge of allegiance in the hands of Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and they were thinking to invite him to Medina, to settle in Medina. So this was the first bay'ah, bay'atul uqbatil ula. Twelve people from Ansar, from Khazraj, Banu Auf, Banu Salim, Aus and Banu Amr. Time is short. I am not going to name all the persons. Just. They were sitting at Mina, putting their hands in the hands of Holy Prophet وسلم, and having the pledge of allegiance, declaring their loyalty to Holy Prophet وسلم, and announcing to become his believers and true followers. Now you know, the 12 years behind after the announcement of his prophethood, what were the behaviors of Meccans? How cruel they were to Holy Prophet. 
how brutal they were to Holy Prophet, how violent they were to Holy Prophet, how aggressive they were to Holy Prophet. Look at their behavior. Look at the history of 12 years. Go look at the scenario of the streets of Mecca. Scenario in Taif. Scenario when Holy Prophet وسلم, was confined and he was sent to a, you can say, a jail. A confinement of three years in Shaykh Abi Talib. Whatever was done with him, what kind of cruel, brutal and violent behavior they had adopted with Holy Prophet But look at, now look at the behavior of Prophet Muhammad. Now look at, look at his mental attitude. Look at his priorities. Look at his model of behavior. Look at his way of thinking. Look at his message. Look at his personality. In spite of all these memories, now a delegate has come from Medina to invite him to settle in Medina. And this is the first pledge of allegiance. Holy Prophet وسلم, is teaching them. And he gave them a lecture consisting of seven fundamental teachings. This was his teaching in the first pledge of allegiance in Mina. He is giving them seven teachings, basic fundamental teachings, and sending them with the message containing these teachings to Medina. Go, this is my religion. This is my message. This is which I have been raised with. And go and propagate my message to the people of Medina. So what is he saying? He gives his message. Number one, first step is towards the faith in unity of Almighty Allah. Number two, he is getting a promise from them that you will never commit any theft. Never commit any theft. Number three, you will never commit any adultery. Number four, you will never bury your girls, your daughters in grave after their birth. Number five, you will never accuse anyone falsely. There would be no false accusation against anyone. And number seven, whatever I say to you, if it is good, you should obey me. Just imagine. No mentioning of enmity of Meccans. No mentioning of whatever has occurred in the 12, history of the 12 years. And he is just emphasizing towards the spiritual reform, moral reforms and social reforms. This was the message of Holy Prophet Islam. He is correcting their faith and he is trying to take the moral, social and ethical evils out of their life. He wants to reform their life morally, ethically and spiritually. He wants to finish the wrong, false accusations against one another. He wants to create good social relationships between, within the society. And he says, next thing there would be no backbiting against anyone. This was the first package of his teachings which he gave to the first delegate of Medina who had their pledge of allegiance in Mina. After that, they became Nukaba, his representatives. They started spreading his message in Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was the first package of his teachings to Ahl Medina, to the people of Medina. Now, the next thing is, he arrives in Medina after his immigration, after his hijrah, and he is received warmly. A great historical reception has been accorded to Holy Prophet And he is given a lot of respect and honor. 
and he sees an ocean of love in the people of Medina and he delivers his first khutbah his first speech to the people of Medina after his immigration the first sermon delivered by Holy Prophet after his immigration to Medina consisted of five basic teachings now keep on adding seven basic teachings as a package as a whole sum of package which he delivered to the first delegate of Medina and sent them as his representatives to propagate Islam on these lines now after his arrival he is delivering his first sermon and in his first sermon anyone could read all of these original sources of history which I have quoted the first thing which he quoted was the fear of God Almighty Allah O oh people be God weariness and you should fear Almighty Allah and you should keep Allah's fear for your life hereafter so that you, you may correct your acts and deeds in this world you may become pious you may become kind you may become pure you may become humble always keep the day of judgment in front of your eyes and keep the fear of Almighty Allah in your heart this was the first teaching of his sermon the second his message was the sense of answerability on the day of judgment he said always keep in your mind that you are going to be answerable to your Lord on the day of judgment you are going to be answerable to your Lord on the day of resurrection and you have to answer on each and every act and deed committed and performed in your life so whenever you are going to perform any act whether in context of your relatives your neighbors other people keep in your mind that you are going to be answerable on the day of judgment second thing third message which he gave that was the message of charity he said help the poor and feed the hungry and support the needy this was the revolutionary message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He wanted to establish a welfare state, a welfare society, a society on the concept of charity, on concept of benevolence, on concept of helping the needy people, concepting the feeding of the hungry, and concept of supporting one another. This was the third message fourth message which he gave he said always be soft in your speech and kind in your behavior I asked the eastern and western world the rulers of the eastern and western world whether they are the leaders of the Muslim groups working in the name of jihad misleading the Muslim ummah misguiding the Muslim younger generations in the name of jihad or they are the westerner writers or leaders or rulers those who one way or the other are misunderstanding the actual face of Islam and they are connecting the brutality aggression violence and terrorism with Islam and Prophet of Islam try to understand and clear your minds and hearts about the teachings of Islam and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam that now he after his immigration is addressing his nation of Medina and the first message which he is delivering to his people is that you should always have soft be soft in your speech and kind in your behavior and be kind and merciful for everyone 
And then he says, if you give peace to everyone, spread peace for everyone, you will receive the peace and blessing of Almighty Allah. So peace will bring peace to you. This was the five basic teachings of his first sermon in Medina. Now, Imam Ibn Ishaq says in Quba, then he delivered his second khutbah, second sermon. And Ibn Hisham quotes, he says that he delivered his second speech. And he says, seek refuge from all kinds of evil acts and mischievous acts of your soul, of your heart, of your mind and of your body. And secondly, he said, try to get guidance from the holy book of Quran. Third teaching, he says, love Almighty Allah. This love will lead you to the life of peace. And then he says, don't allow your hearts to become hard. Don't allow your hearts to become hard and cruel. Keep them soft and kind and peace loving. This is the speech being delivered by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as his official sermon in Medina after his immigration. Allow your hearts to become soft and kind and peace, become peace loving. And fifth teaching which he gave in his speech was always fulfill the promises, commitments and treaties. Never break your promises. And sixth teaching and the last teaching of his sermon was that love one another instead of hatred develop love and peace in your hearts and behavior. He says instead of hatred al-bukhda Develop love and peace in your heart. So again, third time in his message, he was emphasizing on love and peace to his people. Just imagine, then after coming to Medina, first step which he took practically in his life, he didn't enforce the laws of punishment the very first year of his immigration. Even he didn't enforce the religious laws of worship. The laws of Salat and Zakat and Som and Hajj. The basic five pillars of Islam. They were not enforced in the first year of his immigration. They were deferred. The punishments of Islam were not enforced in the beginning of his immigration. They were deferred. Many other teachings related to domestic life, related to matrimonial life, related to other social life was deferred for some years. The first step which Holy Prophet ﷺ took practically was the social pact of brotherhood. Social pact of brotherhood, which is known as al muakhat and this is very famous act, no need to explain, where the immigrants and the people of Medina, the Ansar, the residents of Medina and the immigrants, they were made brothers. And he propagated the concept of sharing. Share with each other your wealth, your properties, your houses, your business, your money, your everything, your comfort, concept of sharing and assist one another and those who are the immigrants, whatever they know about the business, they should teach Ansar and Ansar should accommodate them in agriculture. So this he established a, a atmosphere of mutual cooperation, mutual assistance a social stability and a brotherhood. So he gave a message through this act. 
that he wanted a society of human beings based on the concept of love, peace, sharing, brotherhood and mutual assistance and cooperation. This was the crux of the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this act of the Holy Prophet established the socio-economic stability for the Muslim Ummah. Then he preached them through his practice that you should adopt an accommodating behavior, an openness in your mind, kindness in your conduct. These steps were taken in the first year of Holy Prophet and after that Holy Prophet وسلم, in the same year he took the second step and that was a political alliance with the Jews, Christians and other non-Muslim tribes. A political alliance was established which finally became the basis of Islamic State. And through this political alliance with Jews and their allied non-Muslim tribes, he wrote down a document which became the first written constitution of the world. First written constitution of the world. Holy Prophet sallallahu this credit goes to Holy Prophet, is Prophet of Islam. That first written constitution was given by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu to the mankind. At this point, I would like to mention a bit about the history of the development Western history of the development of constitution so that we may understand the significance of the constitution given by Prophet Muhammad and Islam 1400 years before. You know, in Britain, the constitutional history started in 1100. From the Charter of Liberties, and then King John I, he signed Magna Carta in 1215, which became the first constitutional document of British history, of Britain. And the habeas corpus was the main chapter, main article, main portion of that particular document. Through this, Britain became a constitutional monarchy. 474 years after that, the Bill of Rights was prepared. It was in 1689 and in 1700 the Act of Settlement and then in 1911 the Parliament Act was passed. This was how the constitutional history of Britain developed and they reached up to the level of constitution not written but unwritten constitution. Now I would briefly mention the constitutional history of USA. In 1787 the America declared its separation from Britain. Thomas Jefferson in July 1776 he gives the Declaration of Independence. He wrote the Declaration of Independence. Then Constitutional Convention takes place in 1780 which is followed by Philadelphia Convention of 1787. Then the great compromise of American history takes place in constitutional history. 
and on 17th of September 1787 a constitutional convention finally approved a concept of constitution for USA. In 1865 through 13th amendment slavery still existed and 13th and 14th amendment they approved the human rights as a part of the American Constitution 1868 1868 this was 13th and 14th amendment of Constitution then 1920 just less than 100 year in the last century there was 19th amendment which removed the gender discrimination from the constitution and a woman was also granted a right to vote in 1920 less than 100 year American constitution approved the the case of removal of gender discrimination and a woman was granted to write the, the right to vote. This is the American constitutional history. The same is the Australian. Commonwealth of Australia, the Constitution Act in 1900. Then Statute of Westminster in 1931. And then finally, 1986, it became Australia Act, became the basis of the Constitution. Same is the French history. Same is the German history. Giving a brief picture of the constitutional development in the Western world, now we come to the constitutional development in Islamic world. All these things which were settled in Western world just within last 100 years or 200 years, they were already written in the constitution of Islam. I'm not talking of Quran and Sunnah. In the written constitution given by Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the name of Charter of Medina, which was the first written constitution of human history, which was given by Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and this is their constitution of Medina in my hands. I have written on this constitution. This is book written by me. I have analyzed this Charter of Medina, constitution of Medina, in its constitutional aspect. This constitution consisted of 63 articles and this was given by Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam 14 and 1500 years before. All those constitutional concepts and all those political concepts which were introduced after a long, long history of fights and movements of independence which were just accepted within the last 100 or 200 years in the West, they were given to the mankind 15 centuries before by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was giving this constitution to his ummah, he wrote, he wrote, this is the word, he said, Haza kitabun, Min Muhammadin in Nabiya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a constitutional document given by Muhammad the Prophet and Messenger of God. And then he said that all those faithful Mu'min and Muslims from Quraysh who have immigrated and all those Jews and Christians of their non Muslim tribes. Ahlu Yasrib and all those their allies and all those who will come into this pact innahum ummatun wahidatun bin nas through this document of constitution 
I declare that all those communities from today will be known as single nation. He included in the nation of Medina not only the Muslims, the Jews were included in that nation. The Christians, their allies, the non Muslim tribes, all those communities who became the part and parcel of this constitution of Medina. Holy Prophet declared, Innahum Ummatum Wahida. They would be known as one nation. And then Holy Prophet وسلم, through this constitution which I will mention, he gave this constitution in a written form. This was a written constitution and not unwritten convention. And through this constitution he provided the concept of devolution of powers. A whole state of Medina was structured, was based and was built up on the concept given by this constitution. And there were three levels of the state, was the federal level, then provincial level and then local level. Federal government was formed in Medina. Then all over the country, world, the provincial governments were formed and the governors were appointed and the powers were delegated to the governors in their province. And under every province, the local governments were formed and a lo local government system was formed. Over every unit of 10 people, a councillor was appointed and the councillor was known as Arif. A councillor was known as Arif. And every Arif as a councillor used to represent the unit of 10 people of Medina. And on every unit of 10 Orafa, 10 councillor, then there was a Naqib. Naqib used to be the head of 10 councillors and he was the chief councillor of their local government. And all local, those Lokaba, they were used to be the members of the assembly of Medina. And he established a practice of consultation. A constitutional assembly was formed. And then a political unity was created in the form of nation. A concept of rule of law was given through Holy Prophet. 14 centuries before. When no nation all over the world was aware of the concept of rule of law. The law was just the word of the king. The law was known to be the single speech of the king. There was no, no concept of law. There was no concept, concept of consultative law. There was no concept of mutual consensus of an assembly. And there was no concept of passing the resolution. And then there was no concept of rule of law. And then there was no concept of legal equality for the citizens. All these concepts were practically introduced and enforced by Prophet Muhammad in the history of mankind. After that all local customs were respected and they were provided legality, legal protection, local customs. Then fundamental human rights were granted in this constitution. Fundamental human rights were granted in this constitution of Medina. On equal basis for Muslims and non-Muslims, for Muslims and Jews, for Jews and their allies, equal fundamental human rights were granted. Then religious freedom was granted to every single community which became the part of their state. And this constitution states that Holy Prophet named one by one all communities and all tribes and all religions which were granted the religious freedom and protection of their local cultures and local laws and customs. Religious freedoms. Then non-Muslim minorities. Non-Muslims were granted the full guarantee of their religion, guarantee of their culture, guarantee of their local law and guarantee of their customs and traditions. 
women for the first time in the history of mankind were granted with the rights and this state of madina was declared the state of peace and security and terrorism was legally banned and violence was legally banned from the city of madina now the western world and the representatives of peace who are unaware of the actual history of peace they became claimant of peace and because of some wrong misguiding practices of terrorist groups which are illiterate which are not true representatives of islam which are giving a bad name to jihad usama and people like usama they are neither the scholars of islam nor representatives of islam and nor the people who have any kind of authority to declare a degree of jihad for the ummah they are giving a bad name to islam and i would advise those younger generations never follow these kind of people those who have created an atmosphere of enmity within the human society of the world just see holy prophet named he said that banu of their formal laws are protected he said banu haris their laws are protected he said banu saida their laws are protected he said banu najjar their laws are protected he said banu amr their laws are protected he said banu aws their laws are protected and he said all parts and parcels of this constitutional document indiscriminately their local customs their laws their religion their culture everything has been granted guaranteed protection by this document in the first time in the history of mankind i am talking of article 16 of charter of madina the constitution of madina article 16 it is in my book i have given the arabic text then english version and then urdu version and the constitutional headings holy prophet said that if there would be any person committing an act of injustice an act of tyranny an act of mischief an act of aggression an act of terrorism there should be a collective resistance from the society against every terrorist this was an article of the constitution of madina i am talking of referring article 16 then holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that this constitution guarantees equal right of to right and this is a divine production for all muslims and non muslims equal then holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he stated that all non muslims and particular the jews and other non muslims their right to protection of life is equal to the right to protection of right of muslims there is no discrimination between muslims and non muslims as far as the fundamental rights are concerned then article 30 of constitution of madina holy prophet said that guarantee of freedom of religion is being granted both the muslims and non muslims and all the jews equal basis on equal basis then he said the equality of right is granted to all constituent ele elements of this document then holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said through this constitution any act of aggression any act of killing and any act of terrorism is being declared as a crime in the state of islam in state of madina and this yasrib the city of madina has been declared haram there can be no killing and no aggression in this city and holy prophet said that everybody is responsible to protect the peace in article 55 and then holy prophet said 
that all people, Muslims and non-Muslims, they would be enjoying the equal status according to this constitution. And he said the state is responsible to provide protection and security to each and every individual irrespective of their religion, race and culture. I have given, I have given some glimpses of the constitution of Medina given by Holy Prophet wasallam. So on the one hand, Western world is becoming aware of all these constitutional concepts, all these democratic concepts, now one or two centuries before, whereas all these concepts which were being declared by the Declaration of Human Rights of you and now, they were granted positively and expressly by Prophet Muhammad, Prophet of Islam, 15 centuries before. I would like to emphasize two important things in this connection. One, women rights and one, relations with the non-Muslims. When we talk of women rights, when we talk of gender indiscrimination, talk of gender and sex, it is stated as if Islam believes in discrimination. And Islam neglects the rights of women. This is totally a false accusation. And unfortunately, the model given by Taliban, which was never the model of Islam given by Prophet Muhammad in Medina, the model propagated by Usama and his followers, is never the model of Islam given by Prophet Muhammad in the state of Medina. And Prophet of Islam and model of Islam preached in Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet. Unfortunately, but the Western world unfortunately takes their declarations as if they talk of Islam. No, they are talking of their own vision, of their own version. It may be Usama's and Taliban's version, but it cannot be taken as the version of Quran. It cannot be taken as the vision of Islam and Quran given by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I have no hesitation in saying these words. Islam believes in indiscrimination of sex and gender and race and color and religion and culture in all fundamental human rights. Again, I would like to compare this study with the Western development and then coming to what Prophet Muhammad gave to the humankind. Let me explain that in the Western world, when did the women achieve the status of legal person? Legal person, I am quoting Cotterell, the sociology of law, second edition, Butterworth, London, 1992, page 123 and 124. The concept of legal person, let me explain the legal concept. What does legal person mean? The concept of legal person or legal subject defines who or what the law will recognize as a being capable of having rights and duties. The one who possesses legal rights and duties is known to be the legal person. I would like to explain that this position that when the women were given the status of legal person in the Western world, it would be a very interesting study. Just concentrate, concentrate on few things. The concept of the Western world in Britain, the women, they started their struggle to achieve the status of legal person and to achieve the right to vote. They started their struggle, their struggle in 1897 when National Union of Women's Suffrage came into existence. And then in 1903, about 100 years before, just this century, 
100 years before. Women's social and political union came into existence. And then in 1918, House of Commons, they passed the resolution, the bill, where women were granted the legal status and right to vote. And the voting ratio was 385 in favor of women and 55 still against women. So representation of people act was passed in 1918, just 90 years before. In Britain, the women got the right to vote 90 years before. And still through this act, this right was given only to the ladies 30 years old, not younger than those. Whereas the males, they were given, the, they had the right to vote in 21, in the age of 21. And the army men people, they had right to vote when they were 19. But women were given in 30 years of their age. After that, the development took place up till now. Now coming to USA, the American Declaration of Independence which took place in 1776 had no concept of women's right. Women were not a legal person up till that time. Richard and Current, he writes in his book American History, a survey, 7th edition, New York, 1987, page 122. He writes, in colonial society, a married woman had had virtually no rights at all. The revolution did little to change this. Then Jefferson's Declaration of Independence was only for the white males, not for women. Even white women, not for them. And it is stated in James Burns writes in the Government by the People, 15th edition, Prentice Hall, published in 1993, page 117. He says the declaration refers to men or him, not to the women. And then they say, early American men would not accept the women, them, as equals. Still it is written by John Blum, The National Experience, A History of the United States, page 266. In 19th century, the American ladies, the champion of the American ladies' rights, Susan B. Anthony, she was sent to jail in 1872. Anthony was sent to jail. She was given a punishment just because of the crime of casting the vote. Because she had no legal right to cast the vote as a lady, as a woman. And she violated the law. Then 4th of June 1919, American Congress and Senate, they approved the 19th Amendment of Constitution and there they abolished the discrimination of sex. Just 90 years before, today 90 years before, the women in America got the right to vote and they were accepted as a legal person. In France, in 1848, their new democracy was declared, but women had no right to vote. They got this vote in 1944 in France. In Australia, the women got the right to vote in 1921. The first lady was elected through this vote. New Zealand, the women got the right to vote in 1893, Finland in 1906, Norway in 1907. I'm talking of when the ladies and women got the right to vote and they were accepted as legal persons in these countries. Denmark 
in 1915, Germany 1918, Austria 1919, Canada 1919, Netherlands 1990, Belgium 1919, Switzerland 1971, Ireland 1918, Luxembourg 1919, Spain 1931, New Zealand 1893. Greece 1927 Poland 1918 Brazil 1937 I have given the list of 144 countries quoting the dates when these countries constitution provided the women right to vote this is my own book on human rights my own book on human rights after concluding this aspect now let us come to the islamic position you have followed that in all countries of the western world the history when women were accepted as a legal person and they were granted a right to vote this history does not go back than 100 year or 125 years whereas go behind 15 centuries behind in the period of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when quran was revealed on him in 14 centuries before quran and prophet muhammad declared the women as a legal person by the words ya yuhan nabiy iza jaaka al mu'minatu yubayyana here in this verse the ladies were declared as a legal person by holy quran and they were given all legal rights they were given the political rights while developing the structure of islamic state holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam appointed some ladies in his governmental structure what to talk of right to vote ladies were appointed as member of the parliament ladies were appointed as the officers ladies were appointed as the administrators in the administrative structure of state of madina hazrat shifa bin abdullah adawiya she was appointed as a judge of accountability court and market administration judge of the court ladies were appointed as ambassadors as diplomats diplomats in the period of sayyidina usman hazrat umm kulsum daughter of sayyidina ali she was sent as a diplomat as an ambassador to the queen of roman empire a lady was sent as the ambassador to the queen of roman empire quoted by tabari tarikh ul umam wal muluk women were given the offices and responsibilities in military and army services in military expeditions and defense related services they were given the offices it is quoted in sahih bukhari it is narrated by anas ibn malik when hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala ana had been performing the duties in the battle of uhud umm atiya says that i participated in seven battles myself along with other ladies they were appointed as the military officers in military expeditions the legal status of women was so much protected and highlighted that in the days of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if any woman granted a legal protection to any person in her house the state was under an obligation to respect that commitment Hazrat Zainab granted protection to her husband Abu Al-As and the state accepted this protection it is quoted in Ibn Hisham Sayyid Abu Huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala no narrates he reports from Holy Prophet it comes in Tirmizi As-Sunan Holy Prophet said if a woman want to give a legal protection to the whole community of her whole community 
she is legally entitled to give the guarantee protection to the whole community and that would be regarded valid by the state comes in tirmizi as sunan and musnad ahmad bin hanbal holy prophet declared this right of women holy prophet said again hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha reports in abu daud as sunan she says holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that even if a woman wants to provide protection to anyone it would be absolutely legal and it would be respected by the state of the time then the women were granted they had to play a very pivotal role in islamic society they were the member of parliament in the parliament of sayyidina farooq e azam radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu when sayyidina umar placed a bill and he wanted to place a limitation on dowry he wanted to limit the dowry a woman stood up in the parliament of muhajirin and ansar and she said oh umar almighty allah has not fixed any limitation on the dowry on mar who are you to limit it sayyidina umar radhiyallahu ta'ala no asked what evidence do you have on your view point she said almighty allah says fain ataitum ihdahunna qintara fala ta'khudhu minhu shay'a the world qintara says there is no limitation on the dowry on almar how can you fix any limitation sayyidina farooq e azam declared in the parliament he said that a man he committed a wrong and a lady gave a right opinion he withdrew his resolution this was the constitutional right and the legal status and the political position enjoyed by the women which was never considered in the western world just 100 years before which was granted by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the ladies to the women 5 15 centuries before and as far as their pivotal and influential role and their participation in the society is concerned you should know that aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she was a great muhaddith she was a specialist of law a specialist of jurisprudence a specialist of history a specialist of uh, poetry a specialist of literature and specialist of astronomy this was the level of knowledge given to the women at that time holy prophet gave it sukaina daughter of sidna imam husain who was in karbala she was an expert on literature and poetry hamza bin ziada aisha albauniya maimuna bin saad all of these were expert on poetry literature and various fields of knowledge fakhrun nasa sayyida shahida and she died in 5th hijri in the period of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam she was expert on literature on the history and she was a teacher and fatima bint ali zain al abidin bin ali bin husain bin hamza another she was expert on fiqh al hambali or lot of aimma received the ijaza of sunan al darmi from her she was teacher of many aimma of hadith hazrat rabia imam hasan basri received from her fatima bin qais asma bin tabi bakr salma bin qais zainab bin abi salama umm kulsum bin uqba safiya bint abdul muttalib sayyida sharifa fatima she was governor of yaman sana al najran sayyida fatima she was governor of yaman sana and najran shifa bint abdullah makhzumiya i have quoted she was the judge of accountability court in the days of sidna umar sayyida hanifa she was niece of sultan salahuddin ayubi and she was the governor of halb governor of halb and there were more than 80 ladies imam ibn asad ke received ijaz of hadith from them and then there were many other ladies expert in various other fields 
having their own positions they were granted this they had legal rights holy prophet and quran and islam provided them with economic rights they had right to do business when quran says walil rijal naseebum mim maktasabu walin nisa naseebum mim maktasabna they were provided equal economic and business and trade rights as the men were accorded they were granted the right of evidence they were granted the right of inheritance they were granted political rights they were granted social rights they were granted administrative rights so a lady in the days of holy prophet and in the days of orthodox caliphate used to participate fully in the society and they had a right to vote when the election of sayyidina usman radhiyallahu ta'ala no took place a general election was held the vote were taken by the men and women equally whether they vote in favor of sayyidina ali or they vote in favor of sayyidina usman abdur rahman bin auf was appointed as chief election commissioner so on the basis of majority vote sayyidina usman was appointed as khalifa so in that election it is categorically mentioned in our books authorities that the women had also voted in favor of ali and in favor of usman so they had a right to vote that's why they were sitting in the parliament this was the concept and now coming to the islamic muslims relations to non muslims which is again misunderstood these are the positions enjoyed by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and these are the fundamental teachings of islam and these are the main features and characteristics of islamic teachings and the model of the behavior of prophet muhammad which has made him everlasting model of perfection for the humanity in spite of this fact that mankind has achieved a lot of advancement but the more advancement would be achieved by the human thought the mankind and human thought would never be able to cross the limit which has been fixed by the character and teaching of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam talking on the subject of the muslims relations with non muslims although everywhere the muslims were the rulers and non muslims in those days used to be the minorities but just try to understand the teachings of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before blaming anything this is narrated in hadith sunan abi daud and hadith number is 3052 holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said be aware of this fact if anybody performs any act of violence or infringes a right of a non muslim or violates a right of a non muslim or does any act of injustice to a non muslim holy prophet said by my god on the day of judgment i would be fighting the case of non muslim for him i would be his lawyer holy prophet said i would be his counsel and lawyer i will fight for his right this is abu daud as sunan again holy prophet in the days of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a muslim for certain reasons he killed a person of ahlul kitab a man who was a jew or a christian he was killed by a muslim fa rufi al amru ila an nabiy sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa qala rasulullah ana haqqu ban awfa bi zimmati thumma amara bihi fa qatala he said the case was referred to holy prophet's court he said these non muslim minorities are under my and our protection and i am responsible to protect their rights so he ordered for the capital punishment against the muslim who was the killer and finally as a punishment the muslim was killed as a punishment of killing of a non muslim holy prophet declared that the blood has equal 
status whether it is of a Muslim or a non-Muslim. This was the status of a non-Muslim in the eyes of Islam and this is the status. A delegate of 14 representatives of Christians, they came from Habasha, Utopia, from Najashi country. Holy Prophet allowed them to stay as guests in his own mosque, Al Masjidun Nabawi, and he personally served the 14 Christians in his mosque. He served them personally. The companions came and they asked, Ya Rasulullah, allow us to serve them. Why are you performing this service? He said, No, innahum kanu li ashabina mukrimeen. When my people came to, went to Habsha, their king Najashi himself served them. So I want to repay for that. I will serve with my own hands. These are my guests. This was the stance and position of the non-Muslims in the eyes of the Prophet of Islam. Then a delegate of 14 Christians came from Najran. Holy Prophet allowed them again to stay in the mosque. This happened between the battle of Badr and battle of Uhud. Maybe in the second year of the Hijrah. Fourteen Christian delegate, consisting a delegate came. Holy Prophet allowed them to stay in mosque of the Holy Prophet's mosque. And then the time of their worship arrived. They asked, can we worship according to our own religion? Holy Prophet ﷺ said, yes, you are allowed to worship according to your own religion in my mosque, Al-Masjid Nabawi. And they performed their worship according to their religion, facing towards east, opposite side of Kaaba. And this was performed in Al-Masjid Nabawi by the permission of Holy Prophet ﷺ. Such level of religious freedom was granted to non-Muslims in the days of Holy Prophet. I would like to take you to the day of conquest of Makkah. Come with me and see. Holy Prophet وسلم, who was forced to immigrate to Medina, who was forced by the Meccans because of their violence, because of their cruelty, because of their tyranny, because of their bad behavior, because of their terrorism, because hundreds of souls, they had encircled Holy Prophet with their souls. They wanted to kill him collectively. And under this event, he was forced to leave his beloved city of birth. He left with a heavy heart, spent 10 years in Medina, and every year the Meccans used to attack on Medina. Those who say that Islam spread it by sword, or those who say that Islam is in favor of war, they should concentrate on the history that all wars which took place during the ten years of Medina, which were the places of the occurrence of wars in battle of Badr, it was an attack of Meccans on Medina, which Holy Prophet defended 80 miles out of the city of Medina. The battle of Uhud was not fought on the borders of Makkah. It was fought on the borders of the city of Medina, attacked by the non-Muslims. And Holy Prophet وسلم, he fought just a war of defense. Where the war of trench where this war was fought on the border of Medina where Holy Prophet ordered the companions to make a trench all these main wars occurred on the border of Medina and Holy Prophet spent his life just to defend the city of Medina he never he was never an aggressive he never allowed his community to be aggressive to be violent and to be tyrant The eyes of the human history has never seen a person peaceful like Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the eyes of mankind has never seen a religion 
peaceful life the religion of prophet muhammad al islam so in these conditions when holy prophet enters in makkah as a conqueror in the conquest of makkah he was a conqueror today and the meccans had already surrendered in front of him there were 10000 military people with him 10000 and there was a complete surrender without any blood shed makkah was taken over was captured now the meccan non muslims they were shivering trembling and they had a fear that each every person of them would be killed would be slaughtered would be murdered as a revenge of that day when prophet muhammad was pushed out from the city of makka holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam let our lives be sacrificed on the personality of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam oh ya rasulullah he stood in front of the gate of kaaba and he delivered his lecture and he said asked oh people of makkah what do you expect what kind of behavior do you expect from me today everybody was silent they were feeling no courage to say a single word and they were thinking one of the companions stood up and he said al yawm yawm al malhama this day is the day of killing we want to take revenge from each and every individual who had been committing violence of prophet muhammad and our families holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam became angry and he answered with loud voice he said no al yawm yawm al malhama this day is the day of mercy and forgiveness this is the day of mercy and forgiveness look at the great character of prophet muhammad look at the great model of perfection given by the merciful behavior of prophet muhammad given look at the peaceful behavior of prophet muhammad look at the peaceful message of prophet muhammad look at the loving message of islam he said this day is the day of mercy and forgiveness then he said la tasriba alaykum al yawm is abu fantum tulaka all of you americans today there is no revenge on you all of you are liberated go you are free you are free at that time the biggest enemy of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam at that time was abu sufyan and his two sons holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam declared the house of the biggest enemy abu sufyan and two sons the house of amn he said whosoever will enter his house he will also get amn and security this was his generosity this was his kindness then the sons of abu lahab the greatest enemies of holy prophet who had been torturing him throughout torturing him the whole family his two sons under the fear of being killed they ran they ran away and they were hiding under the covering of kaaba under the curtains of kaaba covering of kaaba and they were fearing as if they would be killed holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw them he went to them he took the curtain up he ho- he held both of them brought them out and he smiled and he said today you have been forgiven go away there is no revenge from any enemy this was the conduct given by holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the same way there are hundreds of ahadith reported by sayyidina ali he said iza qatala al muslimu an nasraniya qatila bihi if a muslim kills a christian the muslim will be killed in retaliation the blood of both is equal imam abu hanifa he says diyatul yahudi wan nasrani wal majusi mislu diyatil hurr al muslim 
it is reported by Imam Shaibani in Kitab al Hujjah, Ibn Abi Shaiba in Al Musannaf. Imam Azam Abu Hanifa says that the Diya blood money of a Muslim and of a Jew and of a Christian and Majusi, all blood money of each and every person is equal. There is no difference between them. Hazrat Amr bin al As, he was governor of Egypt. He gave a, an illegal punishment to a non-Muslim. Illegal punishment to a non-Muslim. The case was referred to the Khalifa, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this punishment was given by the son of Amr bin al As. Hazrat Amr bin al As, the companion, was the governor. And his son gave an illegal unlawful punishment to a non-Muslim. Case was referred to the Khalifa, Sayyidina Umar. He called the son of the governor, son of the companion, the governor of Egypt, and asked the non-Muslim to give the punishment to son of this governor with your own hands as the retaliation. And he was accord, given the punishment with the hands of the non-Muslim. He said, this is what Holy Prophet said. And then he said, Since when you have made these people your slaves, their mother gave them birth as free persons. Ibn Shihab Az-Zuhri says that in the days of Abu Bakr, in the days of Umar, in the days of Usman, in the days of Ali, all the four Orthodox Caliphs the blood money of the non-Muslims who were citizens of the Islamic State, their blood money and the blood money of Muslims were always treated to be equal. There was no difference in their kisas and no difference in their blood money. Laws were implemented equally, executed equally on them. Holy Prophet wasallam sent a letter to the people of Najran when they announced their affiliation to the Islamic State of Medina and accepted the authority of Medina State. Holy Prophet Sallallahu wrote a letter to them which is mentioned by Imam Ibn Saad in Atabakatul Kubra. Holy Prophet said, Wale Najran wa khulafaihim zimmatullah wa zimmatu Muhammadin Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallama ala anfusihim wa millatihim wa ardihim wa amwalihim wa ghaibihim wa shahidihim. He said, all these persons who have accepted the authority of the state of Medina, they have come into the guaranteed protection of Allah and guaranteed protection of Muhammad, Prophet of Allah, as far as their lives are concerned, their religion is concerned, their property is concerned, their wealth is concerned, and all those who are present and all those who are not present, everybody will enjoy this guaranteed protection from Islam. And Holy Prophet وسلم, said, This is my order for the Muslim government. This is my commandment for the Muslim rulers. That even no priest would be removed from his office within the Jews. And no religious head would be removed from his office among the Jews and among the Christians. And none, whether, none of their worship places would be changed. And they will get every kind of protection in their religion, in their culture, in their post, in their positions as they were before accepting the authority of Islam. This was the status given to the non-Muslims. More or less, Holy Prophet declared and the Orthodox Caphas declared that the non-Muslims in Islamic State would be entitled to social benefit and income support like the Muslims if they are ill or they are old citizens or they, they fall to any disaster or any problem, they become enabled, disability. Holy Prophet said, Inna anna Rasulullah tasaddaqa sadaqatan ala ahli bayt min al-jahud. Holy Prophet is stated by Sayyid bin Musayyab that Holy Prophet wasallam sent sadaqa charity to a family of Jahud, Jews. And he said, in Medina, all people of Medina, they still used to give charity to that house. Holy Prophet ﷺ, it is stated by Amr bin Maimun that in our days at Tabi'een and then in days of companions, they said the Rahibs 
all monks of Christians, they were given the sadaqatul fitr if they were poor. Imam Abu Yusuf states in his book Kitabul Khiraj, he says that if the non-Muslims, citizens of Islamic State, they become jobless or they become old or they become disabled or they become poor, they would be legally and officially entitled to social benefit and income support. Reported by Imam Abu Yusuf in Kitabul Kharaj, page 155. In the same way, this was the practice adopted by the Orthodox Caliphs. Sayyidina Umar saw an old Jew. There are various events. And once there was a blind, once there was an old, and he was begging. He asked the Jew old citizen, why are you begging for? He said, I have to pay tax. That's why I am begging and I am jobless. He took him to his house. He helped him financially. Then sent to the secretary of finance and said, from today, all Jews and Christians and non-Muslims who have become disabled, who have become jobless, or who are old and who are not able to, to earn money, from today, they are exempted from the national taxes for their security. And they are entitled to income support and they are entitled to social benefit. And throughout the Islamic history, they were, they were given the social benefit and the income support always. Moreover, Balazri says in Futuh al page 150, that somebody in the days of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, demolished a part of the church and included that part in a mosque. This case was referred to the Khalifa of the time, Umar bin Abdul Aziz He ordered that that part of the mosque should be demolished and he turned back to the Christians so that they may build their church. So he demolished the mosque and the place was returned to the Christian for the church. Islam always protected their churches, their worship places, their ceremonies. Rather, they were allowed to celebrate their Christmas days. They were allowed to sing their Christmas songs, except the timings of five-time prayers. They were allowed to perform their rituals. And the Islamic rulers were commanded that their religion, their culture, their practice should never be interfered with. They should enjoy complete religious freedom. This was the stance of Islam and Islamic history. And it was announced by the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the Caliphate that there would be no tax of their security on non-Muslim women, and the children as well as the non-Muslim elders and disabled and the jobless people and they would be tax exempted from the uh, like other people. Again it was stated that if any non-Muslim dies and some government tax was payable due on him and he died without paying that tax so it was ordered that his tax should not be received from his property or from his heirs. This was the act of benevolence, an act of generosity, an act of moral behavior adopted by the Prophet of Islam and Islam and the Caliphs of Islam. It is narrated in Kitab al Khiraj by Imam Abu Yusuf, page 132. Moreover, it was written instruction by the Caliphs, and Holy Prophet commanded that same too. He said the non Muslim members of the Islamic State they would never be forced for jihad. They would never be forced to become the military members and to fight along with the Muslims in Islamic army because this is against their belief. Holy Prophet ﷺ said and the same was the order of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, same was the order of Sayyidina Umar which he wrote to the people of Anath. He said that they can celebrate their Christmas. It is reported by Imam Abu Yusuf in Kitab al-Khiraj, page 
पेज 145 दे कैन सेलिब्रेट देयर ईद एंड क्रिसमस दे कैन सिंग देयर सॉन्ग्स एक्सेप्ट द फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ प्रेयर एंड मुस्लिम्स आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल टू प्रोटेक्ट फॉर टू देयर लाइफ एंड देयर प्रॉपर्टीज and military commanders were given a commandment by sayyid abu bakr which has been reported by imam behaki in a sunan al kubra even during the war time when you are fighting during the war and you capture the non muslim lands and you enter into the non muslim lands and you take over the lands during the war time don't cut their trees don't kill their cattle don't demolish their worship places and their churches and all the monks and their religious leaders those who are confined to act of worship in the churches don't disturb them in their life because they are not the combatants and they said even their populations and their houses should not be destroyed and their population should not be disturbed these are the clear express commandments of holy prophet and orthodox caliphs that those who are non combatants those who are not in a state of war with you those who are not fighting with the muslims in a battle field whether they are women they are children they are monks they are citizens of a city but not the part of the fighting practically they should not their buildings should not be demolished their churches should not be demolished their houses should not be demolished the trees should not be cut the the other population should not be destroyed on one hand these are the instructions given by prophet of islam now where this concept of suicidal attack has come from i am surprised i am shocked by those people who give fatwa in favor of suicidal bombing and suicidal attacks which kind of islam they are propagating they are throwing their bombs or committing suicidal bombings in various buildings in markets in embassies in trains in buses in train and bus stations in silent peaceful populations whereas holy prophet said even their trees cannot be cut and their buildings cannot be demolished and their life should not be disturbed on the one way this is islam given by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and here is islam given by some ignorant people in the name of jihad they have created a big disturbance in the whole life of mankind i will advise to my young brothers and sisters my sons and daughters don't pay any attention to these people their fatwa is wrong anti islamic fatwa they don't know what islam is they don't know what the sunna of prophet is they don't know what the sunna of the khulafa ur rashidin is they don't know what is the message of islam they don't know what is the stance of islam and they don't know what is the position of peace where islam stands for they are misguiding the younger generations and they are misleading younger generation this is my advice on one hand to the youth to the muslim generations don't become prey to terrorists don't become prey to the fatwas of suicidal bombers don't become prey and get misguided by wrong teachings of the terrorist supporters all these concepts are anti sunna prophet of islam on the other hand my piece of advice for the governments of the western world maybe american maybe british maybe european and those who want to eliminate the terrorism my words of advice for them would be they try to understand who are your real enemies there are a handful of people which can be known as terrorists not all of them and if you become impartial i swear by god that these kind of ag aggressive attitudes 
these kinds of terroristic attitudes this kind of violent behaviors is not just confined to islam you can find these kind of people in the world of christianity you will find this kind of people in world of judaism you will find this kind of people in america you will find in israel you will find these kind of handful people in india in china everywhere let me tell and explain terrorism has no religion terrorism has nothing to do with religion of islam and islam and the muslim culture and the muslim religion has nothing to do with violence aggression and terrorism this is terrorism this is an attitude this is a social behavior this is a criminal behavior and conduct there can be many reasons behind that they may be reactive they may be frustrated they may be bought they have their own vested interest and allah knows better whom they are working for and which agencies are behind them who is protecting them who is promoting them and what these kind of agencies what are their aims and objectives the problem is that since you have connected the terrorism with this to islam and you have correlated the islam with the terrorism this has created a hatred within the hearts of the younger generations of islam because they know that the terrorists in fact real terrorists are not muslims even and terrorists are everywhere the bombers are everywhere this is an aptitude it can be biological reason or outcome of some biological problem it can be an outcome of some psychological problem it can be an outcome of ecological problem it can be an outcome of some sociological problem it can be a result of some political problem or revenge try to address the roots why the people are becoming terrorists on one hand if we keep on supporting conservative attitudes in the muslim world conservative attitudes conservative attitudes i don't need to mention any people in any country but only the conservatism creates the attitude of extremism and from extremism extremism always develops the attitude of radicalism and radicalism develops the attitude of terrorism if you want to eliminate the terrorism from this world you have to address the roots and causes of terrorism and you have to address the basic behavior which is known to be conservative and extremism in many countries the terrorist they get support from agencies they get financial support they get political protection they are used for their own purposes and objectives sometimes they are promoted sometimes they are planted sometimes they are suspended sometimes they are removed sometimes they are restored sometimes they are re enforced so whole phenomena seems to me a political phenomena in this world and this is just again the culture of religion culture of peace culture of security and this is to disturb the peaceful atmosphere of mankind in this world so we should stop targeting islam and bracketing islam with terrorism there is no link of terrorism and islam in the same way there is no link of terrorism with christianity and there is no link of terrorism with judaism terrorism has never any link with any religion religions always have been teaching peace and love this was the teaching of jesus christ the same was the teaching of moses and the same was the teaching of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam love was taught 
in the book of Moses Torah. The love and peace was taught and brotherhood was taught in the book of Jesus Christ. The gospel and the love, peace, brotherhood, tolerance and moderation was taught by the book of Prophet Muhammad Quran, his sunnah and prophet of Islam himself. So religions have a commonality on the subject of peace. Every religion is against terrorism and aggressive behavior. This would be absolutely unfair to bracket terrorism with Islam and leave all other religions and cultures free of terrorism. This is an attitude which is creating further reactions in Muslim generations. So if we want to address this basic problem, we have to stop this phenomena and we have to become impartial. Just address the roots of terrorism and don't connect it with any religion in any community. And just try to eliminate the groups who are responsible for violence and radicalism and terrorism and don't connect them with Muslim Ummah as a whole. So that the Muslims of this country and Muslims of every country, they may live a peaceful life free of fear and free of disturbance and free of every kind of reservation. Prophet Muhammad wasallam established a society in Medina. There could be three models when he was establishing the society. There was the possibility of three models. Either he had adopted the model of isolation or he has adopted the model of annihilation, annihilation, or he had adopted the model of integration. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, rejected the model of isolation. He said all communities who are living together in a state and in a society, they should not live in an isolated atmosphere. So Muslim living in Britain should not live isolated. And those people who say and preach them to live to leave isolation that is against wrong and against the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, Holy Prophet invited all communities to participate in the social and political and state affairs. No isolation. Then there was possibility of annihilation that was to absolutely eliminate the identity of other religions and cultures and to mix them together and after annihilation there should be only one identity and that is Islam because Islam was the superpower or in majority he rejected the annihilation model he said no Jews are allowed to maintain their identity Christians are allowed to keep up their identity the various Arab tribes are allowed permitted to maintain their identity their religion, their culture, there would be no annihilation of a culture into other culture, of a religion into other religion, of a custom into other custom. Every custom, every religion, every culture was given a full respect and protection of their identity. So what was done by Holy Prophet wasallam? He gave the model of integration to the mankind. He integrated all communities together. He denied the model of isolation. He rejected the model of annihilation. And he provided the example of integration. So he integrated all communities together. So Muslims living in Britain, Muslims living in America, Muslims living in Europe, they should live like integrated part of their society. They should adopt the model of integration. They should come out the model of isolation. They should work together with the whole society as a part and parcel of the society. They should pay respect to the law of the land and they should participate in political, social, economic, governmental affairs of the government because they are the citizens. They are the citizens. But at the same time, they should keep their identity. They should keep their identity of religion, identity of their culture, identity of their custom. It should not be annihilated. And Holy Prophet wasallam, my last words, giving just the example, 
last example of his sermon which is known as the last sermon of his hajj of his pilgrimage this was a declaration when holy prophet was finally addressing his community a gathering of 125000 people and he was giving a universal declaration a few days before his holy demise he gave the declaration of equality of mankind by stating la fadla li arabiyyin ala ajamiyyin wala li ajamiyyin ala arabiyyin wala li aswada ala abyad wala li abyad ala aswad fadlun illa bi taqwa kullukum banu adama wa adam min turab this was the universal declaration of unity of mankind and equality of mankind and he totally broke all bonds of superiority of man over man and he declared indiscriminately without respect of any race color religion and culture our human beings are equal in a society then he declared the universal declaration of the human rights then he rejected the killings and violence aggression and terrorism saying inna dimaakum wa amwalakum wa aradakum haramun alaykum ila an talqaw rabbakum ka hurmati yawmikum hadha wa ka hurmati shahrikum hadha fi baladikum hadha wa innakum satalqawna rabbakum fa yasalukum an amalikum there would be no killings he said fala tarji'u badi dullala yadribu badukum riqab ba'din i don't want you to become killers killers after my death live like peaceful religion peaceful people and don't live like aggressive and terrorist nation then he gave a declaration of right of property a declaration of right of workers and servants he said arikaukum marikaukum atimuha mimma taakulun waqsuhum mimma talbasun your slaves your workers and your servants they should eat the same thing which you eat they should wear the same dress which you wear so he declared equality between the servant and his master then he gave a universal declaration for economic rights and stated that economic exploitation is being eliminated today and he said varibal jahiliyat maudu on and then he stated right of inheritance he stated ayyuhan nas inna allaha ata kull ladhi haqqan haqqa and then he stated the right of social identity he stated right of ownership he declared the rights of husband and rights of wives then he declared the women rights and he said wastausu bin nisa'i khaira you should have a good behavior with women with your wife with the ladies and he said fear almighty allah in the case of fulfillment of rights of women this was universal declaration of rights of women then he declared the right of the obligation of obedience of law obligation of rule of law rights of state then he declared the rights of the awareness of the rights of future generations when he said fal yuballighu shahidul ghaiba farubba mughal muballighin aw amin sami'in he was thinking of future generation those who are not present today they should also receive my message for in future in their life holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he declared this universal declaration of human rights 15 centuries after that declaration the declaration of universal declaration of human rights of you and no was given based on the same ideas and teachings which had already been given and principled and provided by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam 1500 years before and as a final word i would repeatedly say that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was and is the prophet of peace holy prophet was the prophet of peace and he just as a last thing i would recommend you to look have as have a glance of the treaty of hudaybiya just treaty of hudaybiya when holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in hudaybiya he was sitting there 
he was sitting and 1500 people were with him 1500 people were with him and they came with ihram with the intention of performing the umrah but there were negotiations sidra um sidra usman was sent as his diplomat and the negotiations failed the meccans did not allow him to enter into mecca for umrah finally it was resolved there would be a treaty and holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted the treaty of peace for 10 years this was a 10 years no war pact between the madina and city of makkah the government of makkah and hazrat ali was asked to write down the treaty and suhail bin amr was the other person from the meccans side sayyidina ali wrote down bismillahir rahmanir rahim the meccans representative he objected he said we are not aware of these words we want accept the agreement and treaty with bismillahir rahmanir rahim write bismika allahumma as we are used to holy prophet said o ali cut down these words this is the verse of quran bismillahir rahmanir rahim and write according to their wish bismillah bismi rabbika allahumma sayyidina ali said o oh, oh, ya rasulullah how can i cut these words holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered him to cut so that the other party is happy and the treaty of peace is accomplished first event the second thing took place when at the time of signing sayyidina ali wrote to muhammadur rasulullah this is a treaty of peace between muhammadur rasulullah and the people of makka suhail bin amr objected again and he said we do not accept you rasulullah if we had accepted you the messenger of god we would have never fought against you this is the point of dispute so we don't accept the word muhammad rasulullah cut it away and write down muhammad bin abdullah holy prophet said o oh, ali cut these words down and write muhammad bin abdullah this was the time when the tears came in the eyes of sayyidina ali he said ya rasulullah my hands do not have courage to cut the word muhammadur rasulullah holy prophet took the treaty paper from his hands he said show me where are these words he pointed with his finger holy prophet cut the words rasulullah with his hands just for the sake of peace and security and he wrote muhammad bin abdullah he said by cutting these words my messengership is not going to be cancelled or repealed so he just accepted their objection for the sake of peace in arabian peninsula this was the second incident then third incident took place when there were some articles where it was written that if somebody from mecca goes to madina a kafir non muslim goes to madina and seeks asylum the state of madina would have no right to give him asylum and you would be obliged to send him back to mecca on the other hand if anybody from madina comes to mecca and seeks asylum we will not send him back we will give him asylum this was absolutely ununderstandable condition in this article all companions were shocked but holy prophet said i accept this condition too for the sake of peace this was the time when sayyidina farooq e azam tears were in his eyes all companions were amazed rather they were shocked and two of them came to holy prophet asking just keep in your mind and try to understand what would be the emotional condition what would be the sentimental position of the companions they started asking oh prophet muhammad are you not a true messenger he said yes is islam not a true religion he said yes are we or not on a right path he said yes they said if all these answers are affirmative 
then why are you accepting this treaty on such a weak conditions what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said my life be sacrificed on him and my i would be slaughtered on the footsteps on the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam oh your greatness ya rasulullah look at his greatness look at his mercy look at his softness look at his peace loving look at his kindness he was rahmatul lil alamin he was against blood shed on the land of of the allah and he was living for the peace on this arabian peninsula he said you don't understand these conditions in near future a time will come when you will understand the secret of these conditions and then there are fourth incident which took place everybody was shocked when the suhail bin suhail bin amr the representative of meccans his son came abu jandal abu sajandal son of suhail bin amr he came and there were chains on his feet and he accepted islam and he was chained he was under arrest he ran to the hudaybiyah and he requested oh ya rasulullah and he was wounded whole body was wounded with blood he said look at my condition i have been tortured they are so tyrant and violent and aggressor i am here kindly take me with you to madina i don't want to live in jail of meccans but when he arrived there there were tears in the eyes of my beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he said o oh, abu jandal i am sorry i can't take you to madina because i have already signed the treaty of peace and i have agreed with this article that if anybody from makka wants to come to madina we will not accord him the asylum so i will stick to my promise when the companion saw the whole situation he ran to abu bakr and he ran to sayyidina umar and other sahaba requested and asked them kindly recommend my release to holy prophet everybody was shocked and they said ya rasulullah what is happening over there what is our condition you have been teaching us courage and now according to them the whole situation was ununderstandable what are you committing to but holy prophet said no we have to stick to our promise and you will see the secret success of this secret insha allah and when the time came the meccan said this year you are not allowed for umrah go back you can come next year only for 3 days holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said take off your ihrams and slaughter your camels and animals he said 3 times every companion was in a state of shock everyone out of 1500 people was in a state of shock unconsciousness they were unable to understand what prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was saying he ordered three times take off your ihrams and slaughter their animals sacrifice their your camels but none of them complied with because of shock they were unable to understand what has happened then holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to his zawja his wife umm al mu'minin umm salama radhiyallahu ta'ala ana and gave out her advice again this was an example to seek advice from women and ladies this was a status accorded by prophet muhammad to the ladies the ladies were his advisor too he said that i have asked them three times and they have not complied with what should i do now umm al mu'minin umm salama said ya rasul allah don't ask them verbally just go out of your tent and silently slaughter sacrifice your camel they are your ashiqeen they are your lovers when they will see with their own eyes they will see you slaughtering your camel they will comply your practice holy prophet came out he sacrificed the camel then one by one all 1500 companions complied with the sunna of the holy prophet they came back holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went up to this extent just for the sake of enforcement of peace and security 
and for establishment of the environment of love and to eliminate the environment of hatred and killings and aggressions and still this blame is again on the on the name of holy prophet muhammad and prophet of islam and religion of islam who is any other personality in the whole history of mankind who ever can bring this kind of example of loving the peace in practical demonstration what to say better even equal to the conduct of prophet muhammad when you try to doing this sir in the history of mankind finally you will say no 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 there is nobody equal to prophet muhammad than islam of prophet muhammad my dear brothers and sisters these were a few examples of the model of perfection of prophet muhammad and his behavior and his teachings and quran and sunnah and his seerah which makes him alive an everlasting model of perfection till the day of judgment no society no philosophy no system can provide better concept of democracy concept of peace concept of love concept of integration then what holy prophet muhammad has provided to the mankind these were my few words of advice i pray almighty allah may give us tawfeeq to understand these things and to practice in our own lives wama alaina illa al balagh